Matthews. I'm the professor of banking and finance at Cardiff University and I teach the final year undergraduates in banking and the postgraduates in banking and my specialism is to teach them banking but I came into banking from economics and what I'm trying to uh, demonstrate to you is that economics is the foundation for much of finance and business and so students like yourself who are thinking about going into accounting and finance or the business or banking and finance finds that will find that economics is the foundation for that subject so um, I'm going to start off by asking you what is economics and, and while you're thinking about that hopefully I'll come up with some ideas that make you think about whether economics is what you thought it was when you, before you came into this lecture room and when you leave you'll think differently about what you what uh, what economics is okay well when I started as an undergraduate um, there was this uh, famous quote by a chap called Lionel Robbins who uh, said that this is what economics is economics is the science which studies human human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce means which have alternative uses now if you had to study that phrase you'd have to break it up into little bits to try and figure out what is that all about you know uh, it's a science studies human behavior relationship between ends and scarce means and alternative uses you know for a first year at university that was a bit of a mouthful trying to figure out what that was and only decades later did I come across you know other notions of economics Oscar Wilde uh, economists know the price of everything and the value of nothing and I hope to demonstrate to you that's exactly the opposite economists don't know the price of everything but they do know something about value now why study economics well as I said to you the, the clue is in that statement about the popular misconception about economics that economists are just people who know about the price of everything and the value of nothing so in the co on the contrary I would argue exactly the reverse but where economists differ from perhaps other social sciences is that we try to measure this value using a monetary yardstick and that's why there's this confusion that we know about prices it's not the case what we know about is value but how we measure that value in terms of a monetary yardstick in terms of pounds or dollars now this once you start bringing in a monetary equivalent or a monetary way of measuring value we come to a slightly different uh, definition and a much more interesting definition and that's the definition uh, suggested by uh, a professor from the states called Buchanan and that economics is simply a study of the logic of choice okay once we think of economics as simply about choices we make then it opens up a whole different area of thinking about what economics is about let's explore this concept of the logic of choice okay um, here's one particular issue here one of uh, my students when I was at Liverpool University went on to Oxford and did some research on when is the optimal time for a woman to have a child now you might say you know there's never a good time you know, to have a to have a child but if you're a career woman and you have a family when you have a child you have to take time off work that will affect your career path there's no two ways about it all right coming back a year later no matter what kind of policies social policies the government might have about all oh, your jobs waiting for you and so on and so forth you come back it does have an effect on your career path because while you've been absent other people have been moving up uh, the ladder perhaps taking up positions that you might have taken up so there's always a cost but the optimal time is what is the point where the cost is at a minimum right at what age in your career trajectory 
is the best time for you to have a child so that your costs of loss in terms of future earnings is at a minimum. Now that's about choice and that's where economists come in and be able to help you in that decision making. How about death? We got birth, right? How about death? How is life valued? Now you might say, well, every one of us is unique. You cannot value a life so easily, but in fact, people do. Insurance companies value your life all the time, right? They work out the compensation. If you were met uh, with an untimely death and you had life insurance, right? That life insurance is a valuation of your, of your life. Suppose you were, uh, had an accident, an industrial accident, and you are unable to work, right? Well, you can sue the company to say, well, I'm not able to work and I need compensation for this. That company will have insurance to pay for that compensation. But they will argue about what is your future earnings profile, what you would have earned if you'd stayed and were healthy. And you would argue one, the company would argue another, and they will come to a settlement. An economist can help in both these. They can look at you know, what is uh, your lifetime's earnings and do a calculation for that. If by the accident meant that you were uh, um, died, of course, again, you know, how much does your family get in compensation? Again, it's about your earnings foregone or what your uh, earnings would, would have been in the future if you had lived. So again, right, economists can play a role in defining and coming to a way of measuring that value in monetary terms. All right, so far so good, all right? We're not entirely disgusting because we can value life and value birth, yeah? Everyone still happy? Okay, good. All right, life, death, marriage. Partnership contracts and the economics of marriage, all right? You might uh, ask yourself, what's economics got to do with this? Well, there are two things. First of all, about the choice of a partner. Right? What is a woman looking for in a man when they, when they think about getting married? Right? Well, of course, we've got lots of information from the magazines that tell us it's about love and you know, nice warm things like that. But we can also break it down into an economic calculus. Right? A woman is looking for security. It's looking for a man that uh, has got, can offer something more than just physical uh, comfort. And there's got to be some uh, income comfort that goes with it. And I think there's been a huge amount of studies on economic sociology as to look at why certain types of women go with certain types of men. What, what class has got to do with it? What income has got to do with it? And again, you know, economics plays a part. But I think the most interesting one is in a married couple, how they divide their time up in the house. Suppose I told you, all right, that a study done by the European uh, Commission back in the 80s came out with the startling, but perhaps not surprising conclusion that women have an absolute advantage of all over men of all work in the house. Right, would you believe that? That women can do everything in the house from cleaning, cooking, mending the fuse, doing the lights, you know, doing the, the carpentry, if anything goes wrong, better than men. Would you believe that? No? Well, that's what the research has shown, that women can do everything in the house better than men. Now, that's called absolute advantage. Do women do everything in the house? Well, what do you think? You observe your mum and dad. Do, you know, does your dad do anything in the house at all? Right? They do some things, don't they? All right? But why is it that women do cooking and cleaning and men do the maintenance, the plugs, the lights, the electrics, and you know, any, any jobs that require repair? Right? Why is it that, that generally that's the way the division of labor is? Well, and that's to do with the theory of comparative advantage. That is, the, what men do is what they're least bad at. Okay, whereas women are good at that. They, they can do better than men, but if they did everything, they'll all die young because there's only 24 hours in the day. They can't do everything. 
whereas they have to divide their labor. And that's called trade, all right? You do this, I do that. You do the least worst thing, I do what I'm good at, okay, the best thing. And from that, you get comparative advantage and trade. That's the basis of the theory of economic trade, all right? So we have research that actually identifies why women do certain things in the house and why men do other things in the house. So, organization of housework. Now, um, it used to be said, uh, a, a friend of mine um, from uh, Greece would say that, you know, uh, when men get together and they're having a few drinks, they decide on important things like world peace and war and, and great strategies. And women only do minor things like where we live, uh, you know, what school our children go to, and what kind of mortgage we can afford, and things like that. But the, the reality is, those are the most important things in life. Not the business about world peace, because they have no control over it. So, uh, where you live, what school you go to, these are all economic decisions, which are largely made by women, rather than by men. And again, it's because of their specialism, right? They are portfolio managers. So I ask myself, um, uh, why is it that women being so much better you know, in, in, in various things, why they don't progress up the economic ladder as fast as men? I mean, for instance, take my profession, um, which is the academic world. There are as many women lecturers and assistant professors as there are men. But why aren't there more women senior professors and heads of departments? Why, why do you think? Anyone got a guess? I mean, we, they're, they're as clever, we all know that, all right? I think uh, there's quite a lot of women here, you're all going to go to university, you're all going to come out with degrees as good as and better as the research has shown as men. How come there aren't more senior women in industry, in academia, in the professions? Well, let me try and answer it. Okay? Again, economics plays a, a part here, right? Because women have to do many things, right? They, they run a family, they run a house, they run a career. That means they're portfolio managers, right? We pick that straight out of investment theory. Whereas men, all they have to do is just think about their career. Because their women, their wives, are doing all the other bits. The house, the family, and the other bits that go into supporting it. So because they can specialize, they specialize and do well at it, they can progress because our society recognizes the benefits of specialism, right? So the men progress and the women are stuck behind because they're managing so many different things. And then don't, they don't have the opportunity to specialize because they have to do so many other things. So again, it's a choice, right? If you choose to be a portfolio manager, you go down one route. If you choose to be a specialist, you go down other route. Now, of course, that doesn't mean to say that women don't specialize. They could, but then there's a sacrifice. And that sacrifice is that they can't do the other things in a portfolio management world, which means that if they specialize, that sacrifice is the value that we put on the business of specialization. What can economics tell us about crime and punishment and tax evasion? Well. There's a whole field of economics that deals with rational crime, right? That people who undertake crime are balancing out costs and benefits. What are the benefits of crime? Well, uh, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? What the benefits of crime is, you know, you, you get the goods. You can take that. But what are the costs? The costs are if you're caught, you end up in jail, all right? Now, it's not certain you'll be caught but there are some probabilities attached to being caught. And therefore, one has to evaluate the expected gain, right? and that expected gain is weighted by the probability of getting away with it against the probability of being caught against the cost. The cost is if you're caught, you're incarcerated. And that goes the same for tax evasion. Similarly, work and study. You have to decide what subject you're going to take at university. You're going to have to decide what university you're going to go to. Okay? Some of that decision, part of that decision, will depend on 
how much you have to pay for it, right? Obviously, you think that if you're paying more, you, or rather you're willing to pay more for a better brand or a better education, and you're doing a cost-benefit analysis, looking at what's the benefit to you in terms of acquiring that brand, how will that help you uh, in your career, and is it worth the investment? Education then becomes an investment decision. That's a choice variable. How much you decide to put into that in terms of your, your study and how much of your leisure time, again, is a choice variable according to your budget constraints, how much you've got, and what your objectives are. So again, economics comes into play in this logic of choice. So what's the common element here? It's all about choice, and choice is about trade-offs. I think this morning, Professor Ken, you mentioned that life is all about choice or trade-offs. I can't remember the exact words, but something like that. And what economists are saying is that if you do one thing, you have to sacrifice another. And what you give up is how you value the choice you make. Now you might say, well, that's easy. Why not do both? All right? Why do you have to make a choice? You can't because resources are scarce. Right? You have to make a choice. And then every choice is a delicate exercise in costs and benefits. And that's basically encapsulated in a phrase that uh, the Nobel Prize winner, uh, Milton Friedman, once said, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Right? Everything costs. Right? You do one thing, the cost is what you could have done with that time, with those resources. So life is a choice, and that choice you make is based on the fact that you've got trade-offs. Right? You have to trade one thing uh, against another. Now we can, we can uh, represent this in the way that you've come across it in, in your familiar demand and supply. Everyone know what demand and supply is? Yeah, okay. Now this looks like a demand and supply representation, but I like to think of it as marginal benefits and marginal costs. And where the marginal benefits equal to the marginal cost, that decides the amount of activity you would undertake in any particular area. Okay? And we call that the calculus of choice. So <coughs> and it's an appropriate technology, this calculus of choice, because you're calculating right, your costs versus your benefits to work out what is the net return on one particular activity as against another particular activity. But calculus, you also remember, is a mathematical tool that is used in optimization, right? Anyone here done any mathematics, except calculus? You know what a derivative is? Well, I hope someone nods, otherwise I'm going to have to stop, all right? You've done, you know what uh, calculus of two variables is? Y and X, dy, dx, yes? Good, somebody nodded, that's good enough for me, all right? Optimization is actually the bread and butter of modeling techniques and economics. You're taught in economics from what you've done is that the objective of a company is to maximize profit, right? The converse of that is to minimize cost, right? Think of the words I've just used, maximize, minimize. In mathematics, in the calculus, maximum and minimum is the conventional way of looking at optimization in mathematics. The calculus of two variables where you have y is a function of x, we can look at the representation of a function x where you can see quite clearly what is a maximum and what is a minimum. So we use calculus in economics to get at positions of maximum and minimum. Right? And that tells us something about how we, how, what choices we make. You want to maximize the utility the happiness or the satisfaction that you feel from following one particular activity as against another particular activity. And that then defines why you decide on certain things in life. So, optimization in the logic of cho choice is that 
individuals maximize their utility, firms maximize their profits, policymakers, governments will maximize welfare, democratic governments will try to maximize votes, right? We can understand the way political parties work, right? If we think in terms of the calculus of choice, they're trying to maximize votes. Bureaucrats, right, people who run things, right, they maximize the rents that they will get. That is the power and influence that they have. But do they always behave in this rational way? Well, quite clearly not. Right? Humans aren't computers. We aren't all rational all the time. But what economists say is that there's sufficient rationality in their behavior for us to expect a certain way that people will behave when faced with difficult choices. Let me give you an example. Um, uh, when I was at Liverpool University, there was a colleague who did work into low birth weight uh, infants, right? the survival of low birth weight infants. If a child was born prematurely, a baby was born prematurely, um, doctors would say that if it's a very low birth, that the chances of this child growing up into being a healthy adult was low. Right? That they'll all be sickly, uh, they'll all be, you know, they, they'll all be uh, a drain on the health service, and the, their family would have to look after them when they get older because they'd be very sick. Right? Now, that's a harsh reality, but doctors know this from experience. And so my colleague was doing this research. Now, why was he doing this research? To look at the life of a, of a child that survives, after a, a low birth weight uh, child that survives, what kind of quality of life they have. Because actually it's important in terms of deciding if you have scarce resources, say a ventilator that you put a low birth weight infant into, and you have two of them, and you have one ventilator, how do you choose? Now that's a terrible thing, isn't it? It's a terrible thing to say, well, you know, I have to choose between two low birth weight infants. Which one goes into the ventilator? The other one dies, all right? But it is the calculus of cho choice here that the research has shown that there is a relationship between low birth weight uh, infants babies and the quality of life that they have. So what the choice that doctors make about taking the heavier one and putting it into the ventilator is actually not a bad decision, right? If you're, of course what we want is two ventilators, all right? We want to have n number of ventilators if we have n number of low birth weight infants, but resources are scarce and doctors have to make decisions. Okay, well, Let's take this business about rational behavior and look at one particular example, the economics of crime. Okay? Um, let's think of crime as a combination of opportunity and risk and the preferences to risk and ethics, right? Whether you, you think it's a good thing or not, and reward. And so your decision at the initial stage is, well, you can go straight, in which case no crime, or you can commit a crime, okay? Well, once you've made that decision, the next decision is, uh, do you want a low risk, l low reward crime, or do you want a high risk, high reward crime, okay? Well, if you're going in for high risk, high reward crime, then are you going to go into uh, white collar crime, which is fraud, okay, which could be several millions of dollars, or you could just go and rob a bank, also, you know, high risk, high return. So there's a decision-making tree here which is based on rational thinking and there's quite a lot of evidence to show that criminals behave in a, a rational way, that they decide they want to use their resources in areas where there's high ri risk, uh, sorry, high return, even though it's balanced out with high risk. And they if that risk increases, they substitute, they move away from the high return activity to the lower return, lower risk activity. So, we borrow that entirely from investment theory. All of you students who are thinking of going into doing accounting and finance will be looking at investments in terms of risk and return. Well, that's exactly 
the same kind of tools we use to explain criminal activity and tax evasion. Low risk is low marginal cost. Uh, the expected return from crime will then be the probability of not being apprehended times the monetary or psychic gain plus the probability of being apprehended times the penalty. So you have these two choices, uh, these two events, okay? When you commit a crime, you can get away with it or you get caught. What's the probability of getting away with it? What's the probability of getting caught? If you get away with it, it's that probability of getting away with it with the, re with the reward or the probability of getting caught with the, uh, with, with the, uh, uh, the if your probability of getting caught, you have to weight that with what will be the cost of being caught. So cost times the probability of being caught is the downside. Okay, well, expected return from crime must therefore be always greater than the return from being good, plus any moral imperatives, all right? If the expected return from the crime is greater than that, then you encourage criminal activity. I'll give you an example about um, ethics, for instance. You might say, well, where's ethics in here? You know, I mean, uh, if you're a good person, you wouldn't commit crime under any circumstances. Well, I was at a, a conference of Islamic banking in Lahore last year, and I was discussing a paper given by a PhD student who looked at substitutability between conventional bank deposits and Islamic bank deposits. Now, if you know anything about Islamic banking, you can't pay interest on Islamic bank deposits. Does everyone know that, right? It's riba is, uh, is forbidden, all right? Whereas conventional bank deposits pay interest. Now, if you were ethically minded or religiously minded, there shouldn't be substitutability between these two. You either hold Islamic bank deposits, you don't hold the other deposits. What this student found was that there was a high degree of substitutability. All right? Now, what does that mean? That means that she interpreted this as that Islamic bank deposits were highly competitive, that all it took was for a small change in the yield on Islamic bank deposits, which is obtained through profit and loss sharing, to go, cause people to shift from conventional bank deposits into Islamic bank deposits. Now, that's a good interpretation. But you can also interpret the other way. If bank deposits, conventional bank deposits, paid more than Islamic bank deposits, people will shift back into them because there's a high level of substitutability. Now, what does that tell us about ethics? Well, it doesn't tell us much about ethics, but what we can do is value those ethics, right? Because there is a price on that ethics. People are willing to trade off. They're going to switch from what their ethics or their religious uh, uh, precepts tell them into something else, which tells them it's, it's, uh, it's harmful or, 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 uh, uh, or inappropriate. Okay, well, we can use that to work out, uh, this here is a, is a kind of a, an explanation of the choices in criminal activity. Okay, uh, suppose we look on this vertical axis here, which is expected return from being good. Okay, and on this uh, horizontal is the risk Right, involved with it. Suppose we say that the return from being bad is at the top there, okay? And the penalty, if you're caught, is down here. So this is the negative aspects of the return, all right? It's a negative return. Well, if the probability of getting caught is given by this funny squiggle called phi, or, then the probability of getting away with it is one minus phi. We have to weight this return from being bad by the probability of getting away with it and the penalty of being caught with the probability of getting caught. And that gives us an expected return. All right, now you can see that as the probability changes, right, that is going to move up or down, isn't it? For instance, if I told you that the probability of getting caught is zero, right? Well, then the return from being bad, right, you reach the maximum. So let me try an experiment with you. And suppose I say to you, um, suppose I said to you that um, you can cheat on an exam here in, in Brickfields 
and you won't get caught. You just won't get caught. The probability of not getting caught is, oh, sorry, the probability of getting caught is zero. Would anyone cheat? All right, there's two people who are honest here who say that. All right, anybody else? All right. Now, who, who would not do it because they've given their word they're not going to cheat? All right. Come on. Who would say, you know, well, I, I'm not going to cheat. I'm going to be really honest and not, not cheat because even though I know that other people are cheating, I'm not going to cheat. Anyone here? Anyone? <laughs> you all cheat? <laughs> Well, I, I was going to go into another example, actually. If there was one person here who's ethical and say, I won't cheat. But suppose, uh, suppose there's one of you who say, I won't cheat. All right, so I say to you, well, in the next class, the professor in there is allowing you to have an open book exam, for the test. That means you bring your books in and you use that for the test. But the professor in this class is a mean sort of person who says, no, closed book. All right, you can't do it. But I'm not going to watch you. I'm going to go out of the room. So you can open the book if you like. All right? So, but I'm expecting you to be honest and not to do it. The fact that you know that in the other room that they'll be allowed an open book, will that change your mind about how you behave? Or would you still do a closed book? Well, you know, you might change your mind because you, know, you think that, well, ethics is not just a fixed point. It's relative. If everybody else is doing it, maybe you want well, to get away with it because after all the probability of getting caught is zero and the expected return then is so much higher so that calculus is very important I, I actually went to a, a seminar about 10 years ago where an, an economic sociologist from the states was giving a paper on predicting divorce rates in the US now three variables explained this statistically one was uh, the income differential between husband and wife. The second was the size of the family, how many children you had. And the third variable was the history of divorce. Okay? Now, the first two are economic variables. They explain the divorce rate. The third one, the history of divorce, explains why people might divorce because it's getting more and more common. You know, if, if there was a high divorce rate last year, that's the history. Well, if everyone's getting divorced, I might as well do it as well, you know. But um, let's look at the other two, income differentials and family size. Why does that matter? Well, the wider the income differential between husband and wife, the more dependent the wife is on the husband's income. And therefore, they're more likely to tolerate misbehavior or any other kind of behavior, okay, and to stay with the family and not divorce. But as that income differential narrows, the probability of divorce increases if the husband misbehaves. I'm assuming this the husband that's misbehaving always, all right, not the other way around. Okay? Now, if the income was to move the other way, if the wife earns more than the husband, then one first sign of misbehavior, bang, our egos, all right? And that is because the wife is totally financially independent of the husband, right, and to make these unconstrained decisions. Same with family size. Obviously, the larger the family, right, the more dependent you are on your husband's income, the more likely you are to tolerate misbehavior. But, you know, if you have no children, no big loss, out you go if you start to misbehave. So, again, two very important economic variables explaining social uh, behavior. Okay, so what are the lessons we learn from my little example about crime. Well, the lessons are about sentencing and policing. There's an interesting little cartoon here. Okay. This, these two chaps in jail, he says, I got three months for stealing billions on Wall Street. And I got three years for possessing a few joints. When I last gave this lecture, it was in Hong Kong. And of course, all the students looked puzzled and said, what's a joint? So, um, so instead of joint, think of cigarettes. Okay, so if I got three years for possessing a few cigarettes, right? And this one got three months for stealing billions on Wall Street. Consider what the balance of risk and reward are there. Okay. What are the applications we can use from this? Well, most types of crime, including violence against the person. Uh, is about 
a means to an end. And the research on crime looks at the way organized crime works, and they find that organized crime works just like a corporate, just like a company. There's a CEO, there's an operations manager, financial manager, people who go out there and do the sales. Well, you know what I mean by sales, all right? Drug trafficking, tax evasion, fraud, money laundering, violent injury. These can all be explained using economic variables. And I want to actually take one particular example of violent injury. It's some research that I've done. And that is the relationship between alcohol and violence. It's a well-known connection, right? We know that there is a relationship between people who drink alcohol and violent, their violent behavior. Now, we know, you and I, that drinking alcohol is bad for you, right? It kills the brain cells. It makes you, uh, you know, destroys your, uh, your uh, inhibitions, and you might do things that you wouldn't otherwise do, right, if you, if you had a few drinks. But the causation between uh, alcohol and violence is difficult to prove because a lot of violent people also drink a lot. Okay, so you cannot actually say that alcohol causes the violence. It could also be that violent people do a lot of drinking. However, the price of alcohol and violence is a possible co uh, connection because you can't say that um, violence causes the price of alcohol. Right? It's difficult to make that argument. But if you find a relationship between the price of alcohol and violence, that would be able to break through that causation argument and say, ah, it must be that alcohol is causing the violence because if the price of alcohol affects how much people will drink, then, and that has an effect on violence, then you prove the causation. And we turn to the first law of demand in economics, and that is that if you raise the price of something, people will buy less of it, right? And that's the same with alcohol. And the price of violence is inversely related to alcohol consumption. And there we are, there's an example of it. On the vertical axis is the price of alcohol, and on the horizontal, we've got violent injury. Okay, and you can see a clear negative relationship. That in parts of the UK, this is the UK data, where the price of alcohol is high, there's lower violence. Where the price of alcohol is low, there's higher violence. Is that an accident? Well, it could be, but I've just got to, given you a, a theory that explains it. So, what can we learn from that piece of research, and how can economics help? Well, the first best solution is that we want to raise the price of violence. Okay, if, if it's the first law of demand works, you don't want to affect the price of alcohol to affect violence, you want to raise the price of violence. What's the price of violence? Well, it's the fact that if people are violent, they should be sent to jail, all right? And they should, you should have very draconian punishments. But the problem for the government is that that requires resources. You need police, you need cameras on the streets, you need to follow crowds and, and look at their behavior all the time and have, have lots of resources spent on that. So what's the, uh, you could have, for instance, zero tolerance rules, such as in Singapore and New York, where if anyone commits a violent act, the, the book is thrown at them. But these are costly to implement. The second best solution is raise the price of alcohol. That might be the easiest thing to do for the government. They can tax alcohol, and that reduces the amount of violence. It's much cheaper than having a lot of police on the street. Well, there are all sorts of other things that would happen which I don't want to go into, but these are some of the things that would, um, uh, that would happen if you were to put too much of a tax on, on alcohol. So, I want to finish off then by saying, well, why do employers value economics degrees or degrees that use a lot of economics, ladders such as business and finance? Well, the first important reason is that it's a numerate subject. It's also a literate one because if you think that you can persuade someone with just numbers and mathematics, you're wrong. You still have to use English to do that or whatever language. <laughs> Sorry, I use English. You might use something else. But you still have to persuade. And that means you have to be literate. You have to argue and make your case. It's analytical. You have to have a logic to your argument. 
You have to be able to show how you derive your conclusions from initial premises. It's an academic discipline. It's like the old subjects of universities, such as philosophy or literature and history. It's problem solving. As you can see, I've given you various examples of how economics can be used in all sorts of strange situations to solve problems and to understand them. And mostly, of course, at the end of the day, you use economics as a tool for persuasion. So um, this is the, the advertisement bit. Why Cardiff? OK. If you're thinking about going to university to study accounting and finance, or uh, business, why Cardiff? Well, the Cardiff Business School has a good reputation for teaching and research. Uh, the subjects that you're going to choose are highly rigorous. They're relevant. We have good degree schemes in economics, economics and finance, banking and finance, business economics, and so on, accounting and finance, all the other uh, areas of finance and economics. And we also have joint with, with languages and joint with accounting. Well, where do our graduates go? Well, quite a lot of them go into accountancy training. Oh, a very large number going to banking and finance, which is my area. Another amount going to management. And a much smaller amount going to postgraduate training. <laughs> but these are basically where our graduates go. And we've got a good record for this. Okay? Some of the uh, students that come from the European Union will go into government uh, service. Now, thinking about doing subjects like finance, economics, and business, but particularly finance and economics, the first thing is that it's not a dull subject, right? It's, it's very uh, inspirational, and, and, and I find it very exciting, the subject. And it's highly valued by employers. Um, I always quote this study that was done by The Times it was, it's quite a late study now, in the 19, late 1980s, a study that came out by the Times that asked the question, what's the bachelor's degree of the highest earners in the UK? All right, the bachelor's degree. Well, who do you think earns the most? All right, and what sort of degree do they have? I suppose you might think lawyers, right? Lawyers have the right to print money, so, you know, they, they could be the highest earners. Could be doctors, do you think? Doctors, right, so medical degree. So it could be a law degree, it could be a medical degree. It turned out to be economics graduates. Now, clearly they're not working as economists because if they worked as economists, they'd be poor, all right? But they're working in business and they're applying that economics training that they've obtained, whether it's in business economics or in finance, they're applying to corporate decision making and they've made it as a result. So the highest earners in the UK Actually, if you look at their bachelor's degree, their economics, economics and finance degrees. So that's worth thinking about. So there is a price, however, all right? This is a hard sum subject. It's not for everyone. It's not a soft subject. It requires determination and application. But if you think about coming to Cardiff, we'll play our part as long as you play yours. So thank you for listening to me.